The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMDs, Alpha, Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now, advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too. And there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world of investment choice that goes beyond borders. Open up a world of investment opportunity with NetWealth, where you can access local and international securities, as well as bonds and foreign currency options for wholesale clients. Offer your clients flexibility, transparency, and efficiency with managed accounts, managed funds, and access to non-custodial assets. A world of investment awaits you. Discover it at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Hello and welcome to the Ensemble Advice Tech Podcast. I'm Peter Diamantidis and the guest joining me here today to deep dive into Lumiant actually worked for both MLC and NAB here in Australia before moving to be the head of product with Lumiant in the US of A and is also the host of the Lumiant Live podcast. So we expect big things from this guest. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me on the show, Mark Ackroyd. Woo! <laughs> I tell you what, I tell you what. As someone that has a uh, a podcast, I, I am I am shamed by how good that entrance is. You make me feel so special. <laughs> it's uh, it's so lovely to be here, Peter. Um, you know, I, I feel like this is a, a radio host uh, sort of interview. Like you know. Long time listener, first time caller. Um, <laughs> I've been a big fan of yours for a while. I'm so so wrapped to be on, and it's so Ooh. nice. I can say say things like "G'day, how are you?" and uh, not have someone go, oh, "Yeah, that's excuse hilarious. me, well yeah. done." Yeah. <laughs> Let alone actually understanding the general things you say. There's yeah. certain words that just never going to understand in the US. Our accent just messes them up, doesn't it? Absolutely. I'm a, I'm a sucker. I always say, um, you know, I'll talk to you this Arvo and they think I'm saying I'm getting an avocado. <laughs> like, oh, no, no, that's not it. So I've, I've, I've learned how to, I'm trying I'm, at least, you know, I, I say things like if you catch me, I say process now instead of process. I say right. data instead of data. Um, niche, ni- wait, wait, hold niche. on. We say niche, niche. <laughs> niche. Ni- I can't. Niche. I still can't say it. Niche, niche, niche. It's That's niche. Right. Yeah, and you know why it's niche? Um, our, our late great friend Gavin Spitzner, who who uh, was on our board before he passed away here at Lumion, taught me how to remember it. Um, when he used to coach advisors around niches, yes. His 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 um his statement was niches to riches. Ah. That's how you remember it. See, that's going to help. Now I'll be able to get that right. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> when you expand time. to the US, there you go, you set. <laughs> right. Well, you do. I mean, it's we all joke about it, but you know, these are English speaking countries. And if you go to the UK, the difference is they've got that we've got the same rhyming slang thing happening. Mm-hmm. Whereas the US, it, it is another language, you know, and wow. there is a translation required. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Well, look, before we pick your brain about all things Lumiant, let's get to know you through your <laughs> use of technology. What is your most used emoji? Do you even use emojis? Yeah, I, I, I assume you're referencing this whole fact that apparently emojis aren't cool anymore. Uh, so what? I, 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 I don't know. The youth of today, they're changing the rules in front of us. Kids but um, I, I certainly still use emojis. My most used one um, would, would be the little shuckers sign, you know, the, yes. the, the thumb and thumb and, and pinky finger. Um, yes. I reckon I use that as a as a yes, as an okay, as a cool, as a I don't know what to say, um, but I acknowledge what's so going on. Here's an emoji. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That gets me exactly. out of trouble quite a bit. <laughs> nice. Nice. And I love that that's the first time that one has come up on the show. So well done. There you go. <laughs> Unique off the bat. All right. And how about, look, our smartphone, smartphones. Some of us even have them now on our wrists. I have I have defied that trend to date, um, but we all are attached permanently. If you had to wipe everything off the smartphone and only put three apps back on, what would you put on your phone? Uh, okay. So, I mean, not to timestamp the recording, but um, we're, we're still in the middle of the ashes uh, right. cricket here. And obviously, as someone that's moved over to the US, I need to stay up to date. So I, I wouldn't get rid of my cricket app right now. Okay. Um, I am constantly on Slack for work, so I need that. Yeah. Um, and then probably as someone that has moved overseas, um, uh, I'm, I'm – <laughs> Maybe rightly or wrongly, I'm all over Instagram at the moment, trying trying to <laughs> keep up to date with everything that's going back home with all my friends and family, and, and we've got a lovely yeah. seven month old here um, that's moved <gasps> over with us. So, being able to share photos of her to, to everyone that's interested is, um, is is helpful as well. Oh, congratulations! That's Thank fantastic. You. Well, so you're looking remarkably fresh and well rested for somebody. For <laughs> seven <laughs> Well yeah. done, you. <laughs> Thank you. I, look, I'm I'm very lucky. I, I won't go. I, I won't go too into it because I know everyone's parenting journey is is quite different, and I'm just lucky to have a, a really lovely uh, partner who who does a lot of the heavy lifting right. and uh, and a, a very a very good baby. Well, and you know what? Good babies mean torturous teenagers. So you know, just enjoy it while you can. Man, she's yeah. <laughs> every seven parent months. pays at some point. I yeah, think. <laughs> she's got a personality now. She knows what she wants. She knows what she doesn't want. And um, yeah, I tell you what, it's the daylight hours that are giving me the headaches. Not the not the night time. She is yeah, all. Okay. She's everywhere at the moment. Oh, right. <laughs> all big trouble. Big trouble. All righty, let's dive yeah. into Lumion. So. I yes. think most of the listeners will have heard of Lumiant, but for those mm. that haven't, let's start at that really top level. What category do you guys fall into in the advice tech space and who are you sort of normally lined up against if somebody's taking a look at their options? Yeah, totally. Um, so if, if anyone's a follower of Michael Kitsis over here in the US, he puts out that massive fintech map um, and he's got, us, he's got us in a category called advice engagement. And for us, um, that feels right. Yep. Um, and we'll, we'll go into why that feels right. I assume later in the, in the episode, but yeah. you know, we're a, we're a tool, uh, or a series of tools that turn into a platform that help people uh, engage with their clients and help their clients engage with their advice. And we'll talk a, a lot about that, obviously, as we go. Yeah. Um, and typically the people that use us or our, our typical sort of, um, sort of uh, comparison, um, especially in the Australian market, we, we often get people go, oh, you're a bit, a bit like an astute wheel. Yep. Um, and, and then, you know, some people look at our, our data aggregation, they go, oh, you're a bit like a My Prosperity. Um, and, and then, yep. you know, there's all uh, you know, there's all sorts of comparisons depending on the modules that that we sort of get, but they're probably the two that, that come up quite a bit. Yeah, and I think um, you know anything that's client facing sort of does narrow down the field a fair bit because there aren't yeah. you know super duper long list of, of tools that advisors use that are actually client facing, but I do think some of them are almost like the bare bones of that, and the advisor creates their own journey, and that that it's just the tool or it's the you know the the outside of that that sort of portal or whatever it might be. Um, whereas I think from a my sense, and you, you, you can go into this, but from my sense from Lumiant is there's, there's far more of the journey designed within Lumiant. Like you guys are trying to give as many tools as possible to the advisor um, to make that, you know, maybe cobbling together some bits in Lumiant to have that experience rather than the advisor creating everything from scratch. Yeah, I, I think that's a really astute observation and, and good assessment. You know, we, we, we certainly have a framework, not to say that you, you do things in order in Lumiant. One of the things that we'll talk about as we go that we help advisors do is figure out what their best journey and experience is um, awesome. through Lumiant based on their, their client experience they're trying to design. But, you know, any good tech provider should have a view around how their modules interact and work together. Yes. Um, and when we think about the problems that we're trying to solve, you know, what we are trying to solve is really scalable, client-centric advice experiences. Yep. And to do that, we've got to think through, okay, at this part of the discovery process, at this part of the progress meeting experience, what modules are you using when, in, in what likely order, so that they feel connected and feel right 
because we yeah. know when they don't, it's confusing for the advisor. And if it's confusing for the advisor, it's even more confusing for the client. And, and yeah. one of the challenges that we're trying to solve really proactively is we absolutely want to solve that challenge for the advisor, but we, we actually really, really want to solve that challenge for the client because if we can help yeah. more and more clients engage with their advice and, and you know, we'll no doubt talk about this and you'll hear it in all our language or on our website as you see it, um, even those clients that we would typically say are the non-financial spouse, so those that yep. typically haven't engaged in advice before because for whatever reason we've had you know, archaic propositions delivered solely yes. around understanding finances and alpha and, and yep. modern portfolio theory. Um, <laughs> but, but equally for those that do want that proposition, how do we do that in a, a much more yeah. aligned way to, to someone's life and, and values and well-being? And it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting approach that I think, you know, every practice is really going to have to end up doing. Uh, we haven't to date because our, uh, client experience or, or the way we serve our customers, we've, uh, you know, we've had heavily influenced by legislation and, and look, we all get that. Um, yeah. But we are coming into a new phase now where some of that's going to loosen up a little um, and the combination of that with tech is going to make this game really interesting. And off, off air, before we sort of hit record, you were talking about how different it is in the U- US and how, you know, they're sort of saying to you, oh, cool, Lumion it can be the differentiator. For me, you know, it can make me stand out amongst other advisors, which I find interesting because to me, as good as a tool like Lumia can be, the differentiator really is the advisor's designed experience. Lumia and all other tools like it just deliver on that, you know, but yeah. advisors haven't haven't necessarily taken the time to really design that experience, like to really think it through. Are you guys seeing that too? Hundred percent. It's it's one of the first things we do with anyone that buys Lumion or is or is thinking about Lumion is is quiz them on what's the client experience they're trying to solve for. Because to your point, and this is yeah somewhat controversial c- coming from the head of product at Lumion, <laughs> yeah, the the tech is merely a facilitator of, yes. of that client experience, right? And and yeah, you know, yes. I'm really proud of our tech, and I think we're solving a, a great need in the industry, and and I'd argue that it's probably the biggest need yeah but you know that aside you could use us you could use a stute wheel you could you know piece together some stuff on dash you and the way that you think about your client and the way that you think about the experience that you give your client and the way that you structure up your tech stack and all your internal processes and then align your staff and people around that make the difference yeah 100 percent. and in fact i i and I have witnessed this with technology where it all goes bad. And often it's that there's a badly designed experience or a crappy experience and they add tech and it just amplifies the problem because it's another yeah. point of friction. It's another clunky thing. The team get irritated. The stuff, the clients get irritated. Whereas if they really designed the experience well, maybe alongside the tech for sure, but you know, really given it that thought, that's when it feels fluid and natural and frictionless and, and sort of magical. You know, hundred percent, Re- really, yeah. really easy example. You know, we've got a, a suite of sort of pre-meeting experiences, uh, you know, survey type tools. And if you weren't on board with that, how you pre-position that survey completely dictates whether or not it's going to get completed. Right? We could, we could, we could design it right. as beautiful and as intuitive as possible. But if you're on the phone going, "Hey, look, I'm going to send you this survey. It's going to ask some really awkward questions that." you know, just go with it, uh, you know, it'll take about five to yeah. six minutes um, and it'll just, it'll it'll be helpful for us to get to know you a little bit. Then uh, as a client, I'm not super excited. No, that feels <laughs> weird and invasive, right? Like, yeah, right. Really? Uh, okay, yeah, <laughs> cool. sure. Uh, and, yeah. And, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get into this, right? But if you, if you consider tech facilitates a great client experience, our definition of experience is it's time well invested for the client, yeah. Um, so it, it needs to feel that way. Yeah. And it almost to the point of like, I think the bar needs to be set for all of us where they want to spend the time as in they're really excited about that time, you yeah, know, whereas I, I, I think that. we're right, but we're so conditioned for us to be one of those things they should do. Oh God, I've got to go to the advisor. You know, it's like the accountant is <laughs> like doing your returns, like, Ugh! right. So I think, and that's okay. I get it, but I feel like we've got to raise our, our expectations higher and say, no, no, we should be trying to build these experiences where people are like, that was fantastic. 
you know, like what? You know? It's got to be that for a multitude of reasons. Uh, yeah. you know, none more so than the fact of the efficiency game is a race to the bottom. <laughs> right? yes. There's only so, especially in the regulated environment, there's only so, so efficient or, or, or you know, as efficient as you can get um, yeah. within process. Yes. Um, and then, you know, if you stack on top of that, the price compression that's occurring in the industry, you know, how do I charge yep. more um, and get more value given that my operating costs are going more? Well, I mean, if efficiency is off the game because you can only get as, you know, so efficient, then you've got yeah. to add more value to your client. And how do you do that? We believe it's a great experience, yeah. um, one that they, yeah. they do believe in, not to mention all the flow on referrals and all that sort of stuff that comes with it, which. Right. And look, we'll we'll dive and, I'm you know, the, the um, listeners being very patient with us as we sort of talk about these more esoteric <laughs> yeah. sort of yeah. concepts. So, but, sorry, listeners, we're going to nerd yeah. out for a bit. But I think the interesting thing is we often, you know, there's all these um, reports and surveys and studies done about what Australians will pay for advice. And I struggle with those only because what it's saying is what will they pay for advice the way it is now? Now, of course, the figure's 500 bucks. Like... <laughs> We haven't engaged them, whereas, you know, people pay thousands of dollars for something that is a wonderful experience. I mean, I, I'm i super sad, but um, in I think it's in Florida at the uh, Star Wars, you know, Disneyland, Disney World Star Wars event, you could have this experience where you stay for the weekend and you're in character for the whole weekend, right? And you get to interact with people like a living story. Now, you can do the rides, you can do all of that, but you're also, when you're having dinner, you're in character, you know, so you can be Han Solo if you want to, all that sort of stuff. Now, I was ready to just slap down whatever they asked me for. I, I wasn't interested in what the dollars were. I'm like, that would be the coolest thing ever. Now, as it turns out, there aren't as many of me as you'd like for that experience. And so they're like, <laughs> hold on, not so much the people that don't want to pay, but it's that they can't pay because it was quite expensive. But I do think it's you know, when we're looking at something that's legislatively defined, that's when we'll pay 500. Whereas when it's a wonderful experience um, in the moment, but also our memory of the impact is high, that's when people will pay a fortune for it. Yeah. We, we, the way we like to think about it is if all you're doing is delivering service, whether that be a product, whether that be an annual a review, review yep. yeah, then you're in the service game and services are commoditized, right? Yeah. Everyone's got a service. Um, and, and that's where you're down that lower end of the spectrum. But if you're yeah. delivering experience, because that is time well invested, people are more likely to pay for it. I mean, you know, really, really topical, but, you know, people are shelling out thousand, three thousand bucks I hear for Taylor Swift tickets. Now, don't right. get me wrong. I'm a Swifty, right? I get it. Right. That's fine. Um, but it's a but good that is, example. That, that, is, right? that is, I've spent four hours on Ticket Tech. I've <laughs> sp- I'm going to a three hour concert. Granted, it'll be the night of your life. It will right? be, but the parking right. is going to be a pain in the neck. There's going to be queues to get in. There's You're going to be to walk queues. through a scanner thing, a security scanner. The whole thing is designed Mate, to I, I was make watching it hard. It. So she's been here in, in Chicago where I am uh, mm-hmm. already on the Eras tour and they're posting to turn up to the merch tent the day before. <gasps> Right, like oh that's how goodness. crazy it is that people are doing it. <laughs> right, like, why are they doing it? It's a great experience. They believe in it. It's yeah. time well invested. Yeah, yeah, and it's look the believing in it and also feeling part like the the whole being a Swifty. Like this is a big thing. Feeling part of a community. I think that's another thing that as a, in advice we haven't tapped into nearly enough. I think Finfluencers one hundred percent get it. Sure. Right. That's actually what they're building. But I think, you know, most advice firms, we haven't got there yet. Well, I mean, which is great because that's a journey that can then huge add upside. value and yes, huge upside. But I think we've got a lot, a lot to learn. So then let's talk about um, Lumion and, you know, clearly you guys have like it's evolved into into quite a significant tool now. What was that initial thing that it was trying to solve? What What, you know, caused it to come about? Yeah, so I mean, anyone that's heard our our founder Santi Burridge uh, speak, you know, probably has heard this story before. But I'll, I'll give you my Mark Aykroyd spin on it um, <laughs> as as I feel it, and sort of why I joined. Right, uh, and there's a there's a few things that are going to sound like understatement of the century as I talk through this. Right, but yeah. <laughs> here, here here we go. The advice <laughs> landscape's changing. Understatement of the century. Tick. Consum- yep. Consumer behavior is changing. Understatement of the century. Yeah. Trust for the industry has been on the wobble for quite some time. Yep. 
I'm saving this entry. So we're seeing more and more people want to start to trust different sources, seek different areas of advice, seek different propositions, right? Because they're, they're disengaging. Um, yeah. And to, to be honest, we as an industry, you know, the royal we as an industry, as someone that's participated in it for, you know, 13 years now, uh, we've done a pretty good job at disengaging clients ourselves yeah. <laughs> with the advice because we've built experiences or I, actually I'll, I'll say we haven't built experiences. We've built service propositions around product, around yeah. people that understand finances. And we know that there are, there are genders, there are um, uh, races, there are types of clients. We call them the non-financial spouses that are completely disengaged from that experience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and when you put all that together, it, it, it sort of creates this massive melting pot of client problems. Remember I said Lumion is here to solve the client problem first and foremost because we think mm. everyone should get really engaging advice experiences. Um, but on top of that... <laughs> We know that there's business problems as yeah. well. So, right, moving from a product proposition to a client proposition, cool story, Mark, but that's pretty hard yeah. work. Yeah. Um, so where's that magic on, wand? On yeah, I'll that. just wave that magic wand over yeah, the business. Correct. <laughs> yeah, that'd be excellent. Thanks. Yeah, right. I'm client-centric. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and um, But on top of that, you know, the, the, the organic growth is slow. Some people in your know, pockets are getting it. Um, that's fine. Um uh, things like um, talent recognition and talent sort of you know retention right. is is slow and hard because you know not everyone's signing up to to learn how to create alpha in, in an investment portfolio yep. uh, as a financial advice firm. Um, we know tech stacks are diluted because um, I can't remember if we were speaking a bit for a bit now. I can't remember if we said this mm. before it was we recorded or, or after, but you know. There's all these great new shiny toys that we think is going to fix the problem. So we go out and buy it and it's so easy to buy this tech. And then, you know, we've, we've all of a sudden, a sudden got a Homer car for, for those Simpsons fans of yes. a tech stack. Yes. Um, uh, for those that don't know the Simpsons reference, it's where you get the best of everything, put it all together and it doesn't look quite right. It's a disaster. Um, so it's a Frankenstein it's a disaster. car. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a Frankenstein car. That's yeah. a more pertinent reference. Um, so you chuck all that stuff together and we, we sort of thought to ourselves, well, okay, there's two key problems that we need to solve here. How do we help advisors um, move from being the smartest person in the room or the most intelligent person in the room to the most emotionally intelligent person in the room to create yep. really client-centric propositions? Because we, we think that's the skill that you need to create a client-centric pro proposition, that deep empathy of your end client. So yep. that's problem number one. Problem number two is... Um, how do we support you as a tech provider to help you get scalable people, process, and tech? Yeah. Right? So simply, if they're the two problems we were trying to solve, the way that we're trying to go about, about it is in, in a three-pronged approach. So how do we create tech-enabled advice, number one? Right. Cool. That's why we're a fintech. Mm -hmm. um, that enables you to quantify meaningful and engaging conversations because yep. that's actually where we believe the power of advice lies. Yes. Um, you know, you know, great advisors have great conversations that are deep, that are get into what's most important to a client. Yeah. Um, but we know that that's really hard to demonstrate sometimes. <laughs> um, you know, it might get stuck on a, a yellow piece of paper or it might get stuck on a whiteboard that becomes a, a little JPEG assigned to X plan file notes. Yeah. Um, so, so that's, that's, you know, prong number two. Prong number three is ultimately wrap it all together in a memorable, measurable and scalable experience. So right. one that your clients rave about, one that you can say, Hey, we were here. And, and when I say we were here, not just the amount of your investment, <laughs> right? We were here. You felt your like state this. of mind. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And now you're here and scalable, meaning. It's wrapped within a great process, wrapped within an experience in a way that anyone in your practice can participate or knows what's going on. Yeah. So, you know, especially when we think about those EQ type skills and those, mm. those soft skills around a client's values and well-being, we know that that's a skill that's learned over so much time, right? I speak to 30-year yeah. industry vets that have developed that through, you know, copious sales training courses, copious interviews, that's a hard skill to pass down because yeah. uh, uh, principal advisors also have the biggest books in their in their businesses. Therefore, they have the less least amount of time to train the next generation. Yeah. So that's why you, know, you made an astute observation before around these modules speaking to to each other. We sort of wanted a bit of a point and shoot approach if you needed to, right? Yeah. And you were in a values conversation using the Lumion values module. 
anyone could pick it up and go, right, if I just followed this screen and pointed to the question, I'd largely be okay. Now, great yeah. advisors know that it's question two, three, four that's not on the screen that makes the experience. Yes. But your neuro advisors can still still have a great conversation using the screen. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. We'll take and, that. and there's power in in that structure. You know, it's yeah. power in giving them the structure so that then they can gradually learn that and they'll get deeper and deeper. It's it's an interesting thing because I think people often think empathy is is um, understanding or aren't they kind or, you know, all that sort of stuff. And in part it is, but it's also an ability to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. That's very hard to do when you have no insight into their shoes. If you've not had multiples of those conversations with all sorts of different people, then it's harder for you to have that EQ. You know, it's harder yeah. for you to have that empathy. Um, so th- you're right. There is a, almost a volume game here in terms of those conversations. But instead of forcing newer advisors to start from scratch, then to have a tool that sort of gives them the, the starting point, almost gives them the um, license to ask. You're like, well, this is the yeah, tool we use. I- this is the process we use. I'm going to ask these questions. Bit weird and awkward, but let's get going. You know, yeah, let's, <laughs> let's go with it. Yeah, yeah, let's go with this. It's a bit right. So, yeah. so I think um, there's power in that, um, and and powering, and then them, like you say, adding their own layers, adding their own depth to it, and and that's where also the differentiator will be. I mean, some advice practices will use the sort of raw information that just comes out of the tool you guys give them for the values mm-hmm. um, and then move deeply into technical stuff. Like they'll they'll use it, it'll provide context for advice, but they'll sort of see it as, as a bit more superficial or just that level's fine. Others could make an entire coaching exercise out of just that, you know. So it just comes down to then, once again, we're talking about, you know, the customer experience. It's what is the experience you want to deliver and there is no right or wrong here use the tool and go hard in the bits that you enjoy, that you know that your clients love, you know, and then you can design your experience that way. Absolutely. That's it. That's yeah. exactly exactly how we think about it. So then for the practices that are really, I mean, with any tech tool, there's the people that take it on, don't get it, therefore don't continue. There's the ones that take it on and use it and it's okay. And then there's the others that sort of go hard and really get it. What do you think, how does the practice operate that sort of really – amplifies the value of using Lumion. What does that look like? Yeah. So part of this is a function of the way that we work with practices that, that, that buy us as well. So um, one of the first things that we do, uh, our customer success team, when someone purchases Lumion is we sit down with them and go, great, you obviously saw some value in it. Um, t- tell me a bit about your client experience as it stands now. You know, when we when you go through your introduction phase, discovery, strategy consult, advice presentation, implementation, progress, you know, all of those experiences, tell me how it works right now. The question we then go and ask is, how do you want your client to feel during all of those? And that's the yeah. key question when it comes to experiences. And as we, you know, as we gradually map all of that out, you know, their sort of intent through each phase, how they want a client to feel, what they do right now, so and and therefore what they're not willing to give up. You know, some people swear by yep. their risk profile or whatever right. that might be. Fine, yeah. cool. I don't want to replace it, mate. That's that's all yeah. sweet. Yeah. Um, so whatever they want to hold dear, then we go and go. Okay, great. Here's where we think we can add to that experience intent with our values module or our life module. Or if you right. use the life values goals module here, um, we might use our investment preferences module over in this phase. You might use our best life modeling tool over in this phase. And then when okay. it comes to your progress meeting experience, you might do this and we match it back to you. So that's a long way of saying once we've done that work, the practices that that um, use us really well stick to process. Yeah. <laughs> really simply. Yeah. Now, th- that is a function of a ton of work, right? Yeah. So the ton of work I could summarize really simply in the when they do that mapping of the ideal experience, they've got the right people in the room. We typically try to speak to the the decision maker, you know, whether yep. that be the principal or the business owner, the change champion. That's usually yep. the person whose voice carries. It could be a you know a, an elder statesman of the of the um, of the business. You know, might even be uh, a senior admin sometimes. Like it just correct. depends for the dynamic Absolutely. of the practice, right? Absolutely. And then your uh, your ops champion, right? The person that's going to make sure that the cogs in the machine are always turning. And if they're in the room and they're cohesive, 
then we know that that practice has a far better chance of success. Yeah. Because your ops champion makes makes sure that it's all in the templates, right? Right. Your 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 change champion, who's that elder states person, whether that be an advisor or a, or a senior admin person, will make sure everyone feels supported. We'll we'll back up the tech when no doubt something probably goes wrong in your first values conversation because it's <laughs> awkward and weird. Right? Yeah. Um, but they'll back it up and go, keep going, right? I yeah. did it. I failed. I was okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and your decision maker is the one that pays the bills, right? So they keep paying the bills and keep the tech there. That you know they're committed to the cause because yeah, whether it be Lumion, whether it be a Street Wheel, Raw, Dat, whatever, when you make these choices, you've got to you've got to design the experience or design the intent, implement it, stick with it, iterate. Yeah, yeah, and it's um there's there's a sort of a layer there also of letting it sit, like do it and let it sit, wait and see what happens. Because look, it's very rare. There are there are a handful of instances, but it's very rare when you implement something like this, if any type, any tech, any change to use your experience where you instantly get every client saying that was the best thing, thing ever, you're <laughs> yeah. a hero. Like it just doesn't work that way, right? It, it You get, you start seeing change. You start seeing, I mean, it could be a change in morale of the team. Like there's all sorts of things that you can start to watch because they're like, wow, this is cool. I'm really enjoying that. And I mean, to that point, you know, is there, you know, you could almost start with the values discussion being done between team members, one team member doing it with another team member, because they'll probably surprise each other, you know? Yeah. One, one um, of the exercises that we, we give to uh, our new clients is we call it a Lumion date night, um, effectively like a, a, a 15 step guide to like our life discussion around the eight dimensions of well being, our values discussion and setting goals. You can do it with a business partner. You can do it with uh, with your, your your own partner at home because yep. we know these are conversations that people don't have themselves, let alone mm. as the advisor. And you know, we call it a date night because we encourage you maybe crack a bottle of wine, right? Maybe right. maybe put a fire on and 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 you know, sit relax. down with your significant other, yeah. relax into it um, be, because it is different. And, uh, yeah. and we're cool with that. You should be cool with that. Hang on. Yeah, and it's it's such an interesting thing when you talk. I mean. Goals based advice, you know, is is such a dry name <laughs> for what we're talking yeah. about. But and it's much more than that. But I think the assumption, the error we make when we talk about um, advice that way is assuming people know what they want or can yeah. enunciate it, and they may know deep down, but most people can't just run it off. In a, well, what I want to do is in two years I want to do this, and in four years I want to do that. And blah, blah, blah. in fact, those people have probably already seen an advisor because they're just really well organized <laughs> and structured. Yeah. So, you know, we've <laughs> discovered as we have these conversations, I had one couple, um, lovely young couple, and they're actually more self aware than most. You know, they're trying to, they've been doing barefoot investor, like they're really trying to get on top of things. Absolutely. Yeah. Right? Awesome. And, and proactive. I love that stuff. And what was interesting is she admitted that down the track, and of course, you know, I turned 50 this year and she's approaching that sort of Android down the track. She'd love to get a job she didn't have to think about. So she's cool. been driven and focused and said, you know, I'd love to give it, get a job then that could be four days. I could turn up. They would love it. You know, I'd add value, but it just didn't really tax me or feel stressful. And that completely stunned her partner. Yeah. Never have they, she's never mentioned it, she's, but because it took time to get to that point, you know, that level of safety, of being willing to just throw things like, hey, you know, what about this? Is that possible? Because part of what we're trying to break through here is people's assumptions about what they can do, right? Yeah, well, and you've well, got to unshackle them. Yeah, uh, correct. Two two quick anecdotes on that. You know, the, the first one, little client story. Um, you know, one of my favorite ones, uh, akin to what you just said, where the cl- the couple haven't had these types of conversations before. Northern beaches of Sydney, quite a, a, a you know a, quite a, a nice house as you could imagine, um, and they picked the values card. I want to live in a better place, right? right. And and you know we train advisors and the system helps them go okay why why is that one important to you non financial spouse goes first why is that one important to you financial spouse and we deliberately do that fyi because typically the non financial spouse doesn't get a voice so we give them the voice first yep. and i could go yep. on why we do that um, for awesome. all sorts of reasons but yeah um so they had this conversation right based on that framework and it turns out their goal what they thought coming in was they wanted to renovate their house um, it, which would have cost them, I think, close to 500000 bucks. you know, mm. Northern Beaches is, is Sydney. Mm. Um, but actually, what, when they really talked about what living in a better place meant to them, they actually wanted to escape it all, get into a smaller place and downsize. 
we're, we're talking like a, a million dollar swing, right? Right. <laughs> Just because I haven't had right. the chat. And they're like, oh, I thought you wanted the Renault. No, I thought you wanted the Renault. Right. <laughs> it's the Spider Man meme. Right? You know, everyone's pointing at each other. Yeah. Um, absolutely. so that's anecdote number one. Anecdote number two to your point around we we try to put everything in this nice box. And I understand why we do this. You know, nomenclature is important, values based advice, goals based advice, life coaching. You know, yeah, holistic financial planning, whatever it is, whatever helps us, you know, feel convicted. I think is the, yeah. the term that makes the most sense. But the 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 little spanner in the works that I'll throw through watching people do this and through some of the conversations I have with behavioural scientists over here uh, in the US, I, I've been lucky enough to to hold court with a couple of them. Is that we also assume that the client not only knows their goals but is presenting their authentic self. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I, so I, true. I, I only heard I only heard this for the first time when I moved over here, and I, I was talking to someone about it. Um, and uh, and he was like, y- "You've got to assume, or you've got to think that client could be putting on a persona because they yeah. assume the financial advisor needs them to know about money, needs yes. them to know about, and needs them to have their stuff in order, um, needs them to to be able to articulate what's happening on Wall Street." So they go and study up and like, yeah, yeah, I got everything in, in order. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's really true. And and in fact, I think you could safely assume nobody you're seeing is representing early on is representing their authentic self because Absolutely we, not. we're taught not to. And it's a natural defense mechanism, right? It's it, to protect yourself. And so we sort of don't share all of ourselves. Unfortunately, though, there's – and this would happen as, as you get older particularly – is we sort of learn to almost, um, you know, sort of cut off all of those edges. We sort of take it, you know, and get a bit too sanitized and normal and, and the same as everybody else and take on the conditioning messages we get and, oh, you should retire then and, you know, all these things we absorb. And it's only in our unconscious reactions that, you know, some of that authenticity comes out. I've I've experienced that actually when we, my husband and I travelled soon after I got purple streaks in my hair, right? So yes. I'm a redhead <laughs> and then I've got these bright purple streaks and – What's interesting about that is I can't tell you how many people comment on it. Like we'll just you'll be standing at the lights and like, cool, I really like the purple streaks. Like, what the hell? Like, it, uh, to me, that's a strange <laughs> thing to do. And I yeah. told, I went back and I, I mentioned it to my hairdresser and I said, I just think that's really weird. Like, why would yeah. they comment? And he said, Peter, you don't understand. That person secretly wished they had enough guts to do that. That's what they're yeah. actually saying. You know, and subconsciously, it was just a, a lovely compliment and, you know, yay them for saying it. It's lovely. But actually yeah. what they were saying is, I wish I could do that, right? And so, you know, that's true of all sorts of stuff. I wish I could quit my job and go and, you know, move overseas and start a different career or I would like then it's going to take time for you to get to that truth for people. They're just not going to share it initially. So you do need a process to help them both trust you enough but also unlock that for them. Right, they're not trying to resist. It's just natural. Absolutely, Peter. You know, um, a bit of a bit of stat chat for those that like the numbers, right? So over here, there's a, um, a, a, a planning software, a modeling software called Money Guide Pro. If, you, if you're familiar with it, has a, about a third of the American market. So let's okay. call it 100, 130, 140 thousand advisors use it. Um, they, on average, in their modeling plans, have one and a half goals per client. Oh. Right, and when you go down that next level further, it's <laughs> retirement, and sometimes the second goal is save for college, save for kids' college, oh, which you know, it's very American goal. Sure, but that's sad. One, one and a half, like I, I can't help but think there's a bit more to life. Right, and <laughs> right? what about all the years between now and retirement? Like, what, yeah, what are we right? doing there? Right? And you know, I, 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 I you know, I, I think about my days um, back at my previous role, and and you know, you'd see plans, and everyone wants to retire at sixty five on fifty two thousand right. dollars per, which might absolutely be a goal. I, I'm not knocking that, and totally, but 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 I come back to, I, I reckon there's a little bit more going on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. right, and and in fact. When you look at the people that each of us might be envious of, like we look and we go, wow, that's fantastic they're doing that. I'm envious of it. It's often in our head, it's how the hell did they pull that off? Absolutely. How do they manage to do that? And that's a planning exercise. And I don't mean that in in an advice sense. I just mean they're good at planning and getting it done. You know, they don't wonder what if. Yeah, I also think there's, um, and, you know, I think there's an element where the advisor's got to be, happy and willing and able to sit in the mess 
Yes. Right? Because it, if you do, if you do take the assumption that that there's a bit more to life than one and a half goals per client, yeah. then then you've what? you've sort of got to ask the questions to see what's more than the one and a half. Yeah. Um, and be willing to accept wherever that conversation goes. You know, whether it be fear of regulation and fear of compliance that we're trying to get it to that retire at age 65, 52, because I know that that's going to pass the sniff test, yep. whether it's because I actually don't know what, how to, what, what to say to someone if they say, oh, I really want to uh, I really want to quit my job. And you're like, well, shit, no, you need to keep working because otherwise you can't do the other things. Yeah. Whatever that might be, yeah. like you, you've actually just got to be okay with that. And, and yes. I, I see that as a really tough skill. And a lot of the coaching that we end up having to do with a lot of advisors is it's cool. You don't need to solve the problem, but you absolutely need to have the conversation. Definitely. And I mean, we've, I've even started doing, cause we've been doing more of this sort of cash flow conversation, which is different. Yeah. It's such a different game. Um, oh, although people still have that little understanding, you know, I mean, they, they know that little about cash as they do about super and all these other things. So sure. in that sense, it's quite similar. Um, <laughs> but it's been, what I've started doing is as, as, and we do a bit of a, a brainstorming exercise for all of the, let, let's call it a wish list, but you know, yeah. all that sort of stuff. And then I get them to pick a few and I r- intentionally get them to pick some really way out there. There's no chance in hell options, right? Maybe yeah. one per spouse. And then I actually go away and model all of it like it could all happen. And yeah, invariably, nice. with a little bit of forethought, it's all possible. Yeah. Right? Invariably. And yeah. the stunned silence when you show them that f- some thinking now and behavior now and you stick to some of that, then you, all those things you mentioned, you could do. Here, see, I've modeled it all out for you. You do this here, you do this here, you take your sabbatical, then you do your thing. You know, like, I'm like, are you serious? Yeah, I'm serious. And what's interesting is it's very hard to anchor behavior for a future self. It's We're not very good to our future self. but We're, we're when, horrible at connecting with right? our future self. We're, yeah. hope, we're hopeless. But when you can see all of that possibility, suddenly spending a little less on some silly stuff now yeah. seems like a, a great trade-off because it's like, are you serious? Yeah. Like, yeah, that's absolutely. what I can do? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Um, you know, Brendan Fraser, um, who, you know, is quite big in the, Love the his work. Yeah. yeah, right. I think your audience would probably know him quite well, but he calls it connecting planning to purpose. Yes. Right. And I think yes. that's, I think that's the game. Um, yes. because at the end of the day, unfortunately, unless someone has figured this out, if they have call me, <laughs> you can't be with your, your client every minute of every day when they're making decisions around their life and their money. No. So you have to you have to do some sort of coaching, behavioural change, yes. uh, set up structures, whatever it might Guardrails, be. Whatever Guardrails, whatever it is. Guardrails, yeah. inspire them to make change, whatever yeah. your chosen method of behaviour change might be, yeah. to give them every opportunity to do that. An invitation to dream, like you said, is huge and, mm. and the, the role of permission is massive. The, yes. you know, the two things at play in just that example. Um, and, you know, you, you, can, you can certainly find smart tech and, and smart experiences to do that. You can. And, and I think, you know, there is a bit of um, EQ or behavioral science. You've got to totally. start to get your head around. And I'm still doing a lot of reading on this to try and get, get there. But certainly. Well, and it'll be ever evolving. Right. Because it's, you know, it's the human brain. So heaven help us. Um, But um, one of the things I have noticed in terms of the way that I've started behaving with these types of clients is they sort of, the initial division is whether they have a scarcity mindset or an abundance mindset. And Mm -hmm. I, you know, behave differently. Scarcity, I'm going to have to convince them to do stuff. Like this is, I'm going to have to drag it out of them. They're going to need to see all that potential. And then, yep, great. We'll start to loosen the purse strings a bit and we'll start to enjoy life. Whereas the abundance (laughs) mindset is like, Okay, that's great, but let's actually work out if you care about all those things that you want to do. Like, so yeah. it's it's a different, and once I've sort of, and, and they'll use language early on that will start to flag that. Like you really get yeah. a sense. Um, yeah. And I think once I've done that, then it's sort of almost like two funnels. You know, they're two different funnels and two different things you'll do for them. And, of course, there's nuance on that. But but I sure. think, yeah, the and that's where I love that, you know, with education now in Australia and what we're required to do, the behavioural finance is now part of that because it, can make a huge difference, you know, the the extent to which we understand some of that um, and really tap into it for the consumer. 
Now, talk to uh, me absolutely. about the client's yes. access. So we've got Lumion and the advisors doing mm. wonderful things. We've got this great experience. From yeah. the client's perspective, what's mm. their – so there's the one-off maybe values discussions, some some survey style things. Mm. What else is the interaction for the client like? What does that involve potentially? Yeah, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a great question uh, right now, Wheelhouse. So um, go with me as I talk you through it. So <laughs> – um, we like to think, and, and part of that problem that we were trying to solve, right, is is how do we obviously get clients to engage with yeah. their advice? Yeah. So we're <laughs> trying to figure it out, yeah. as, as with everyone. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we like to think of uh, Lumiant and the environment that we've created is the place where advising clients can call home. Right. Um, and what we mean by that is these suite of tools and exercise that we've built whether it be our Your Life survey that helps you uh, assess your fulfillment across eight dimensions of well-being, whether it be the values conversation that helps you pick your top five values and have a conversation around what's important to you, whether yeah. it be our goals module that you can, you know, classes to do, doing done, get really tangible, move it into the done column, put images on it so it becomes a big vision board, yeah. whether it be our Best Life Monte Carlo model, uh, modeling tool that tells you if you're on track, off track or overfunded and therefore going to die rich, not live rich, whether yeah. it be any one of those modules and, and the, the six others that we've got and, and soon to be a couple more, we've designed them in a way where the advisor takes the client through them but the client ends up inheriting them as the platform that they log back into. Right. So everything that they've done with their advisor is building out the platform or the portal, if you want to use that language, that they end up logging back into that they see these are the areas of well-being important to me. These are the values important to me. These are the goals we discussed. This is the modeling scenario we're working towards. These are the key advice areas that my planner has recommended that they're working on with me. These are the tasks that I have to go do. These are my investment preferences and, and why I felt that way. Um, and here's all my documents in my, my beautiful vault and, and, and soon to be here's how my net worth is tracking over time. They yeah. can log back in, right? And once we've got that data, we can nudge them around it. We can do all those sort of, sort of cool okay. things. So why that's super important for us is that we, we believe one of the key reasons clients don't engage with their advice is they're not part of the process. Yep. <laughs> and they're not part of the experience. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, why are almost a victim of it, aren't they? <laughs> oh man. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've spoken, I've spoken before around the, um, the, the pros and cons of the, the dreaded whiteboard. Right. But like you, you think about the old whiteboarding experience and nothing against the whiteboard, I think used well, they're great educational tools, but not used well. It's an advisor with their back turned, writing something up on the board and then turning back and explaining it in a, in a sort of parent child or teacher student type relationship. Yeah. yeah. So there's a power imbalance, right? And, and yeah. not everyone learns that way. You know, yeah. some people learn visually, some people learn audi aud audibly, some yeah. people learn kinesthetically and need to get hands on. So, you know, with all these tools, even say our best life Monte Carlo simulator, um, you know, clients can get back in and have a bit of a play, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, we've got to make sure they don't mess up the, the scenario that we're working with, and that's yep. fine. But getting them engaged is is not a bad thing um, because, it, you know, if, it, you know, majority of people are kinesthetic learners uh, and visual learners, right? Yeah. And if we can give them experiences that are, are sort of largely there, you know, we're taking a punt that we get the majority of people in there. <laughs> right, right, absolutely. And and it's, uh, it's such an interesting thing too because um, – it, and I hesitate to say this because every tool has it and this is not a judgment sure. at all, but no. most people don't understand graphs. It's just a fact. Yeah, yeah. Most people in the public yeah. don't understand graphs and yet the height of communication from financial services is a graph. That's when we're really like ninja level communicators oh, is a graph. Yeah. And it's like, oh, my God. And I get why because totally. to us that's making tangible the numbers, right? Yeah. So that's us translating the numbers. And I – and it's a step in the right direction, without a doubt. But oh, yeah. I think I'm I'm excited about a future where you were talking about having, you know, the the um, goal and it and it, you know, being getting done or you know that sort of stuff. I I'm excited about a future that could involve, um, you know, a virtual reality experience where the future is a bit hazy, and then as they tweak the different things, the actions they take, then the Harley Davidson becomes more real and vivid to them in the future, and the yeah. you know the moving to France becomes more so they can visually see the impact of what their life story will become based on the actions as a, and the numbers are behind it, but we're not 
demonstrating that through a graph. We're demonstrating it vis- truly visually, you know, so I, I tangibly agree. visually. I, I agree. So we, we come up with, we, we encounter this problem within our best life Monte Carlo modeling tool all the time, right? Yeah. And um, I can't remember if this is going to be video or not, but it, for, for those listening, you know, when, when Peter was talking about graphs, I actively put my head in my hands because... <laughs> I'm dealing with it at the moment in product design ah. around this. Yeah, we're revamping this model. I'm like, I know I need a graph. I, I, I know I know our advisors are going to want it, but how do I do it in the most client friendly way? And here's how we're thinking about it. Right, I'll lift I'll lift uh, lift up the covers. When I think about modeling and when I think about how I want a client to feel, right? I, I want a client to feel engaged, empowered, that they know at a glance if it's working. Right? Are they on track? Are they off track? Um, are, are they overfunded, right? Are they actually right. too scarce in their mindset, right? And could do a little bit more, um, you know, and, and do they know what the action is that they need to take? Yes. So if I think about that's how I want clients to feel when they're working through this tool with their their advisor, then we structure we structure that experience deliberately from a visual hierarchy perspective um, when we're designing it. The first thing that they see is a, a traffic light system, mm-hmm. red, red, amber, green. Right. Yep. Uh, Red, I'm off track. Um, so go talk to your advisor. You, you, yep. you, you don't morning, have enough morning. to meet your goals. Yep. Yeah, correct. Green, on track. Sweet spot, all good. Keep doing what you're doing. Amber, um, you're overfunded. Right. Not bad. If your goal is to, to die with a mattress stuffed full of money, sick. You're on track yep. for that. Yep. But if your goal is to live a rich life, one that is filled with memories and experiences with your loved ones, hey, go speak to your advisor. I reckon you can do a little bit more. Yeah. So that's right at the top. The next question is if I'm on track, off track, to what? Right. <laughs> so so we, we we play back their goals straight underneath it. These are the goals along the timeline that uh, you said were important to you. So are you on track, off track to those? Then we get into the graph. Yeah. And we do that deliberately because here's the thing. We know financial spouses and advisors will scroll down. They want to go to the graph. They yep. love the numbers. In fact, we even enable it where they can get to the spreadsheet behind the graph if they want. Yep, <laughs> yep. for sure. <laughs> get it. People are spreadsheet people. I get it. Yep. Um, but for the non-financial spouse, which we think is the majority of people, yep. the top two are enough. Yes. Top two are more than enough. And that's the empowering experience I want because if you if you, if you you start with the other stuff, I'm disengaged. I feel like I'm being spoken down to. And if I don't understand, I'm not going to do. So simple as no, that. No, and, and – you know, it's it's so important to remember this is their life. I mean, when you look at a <laughs> lot of what goes on in advice or even the commentary around, I mean, we're obsessed with retirement and super, right, in this country. And the shame of that is there's so much living. I mean, for myself, I mean, we our retirement won't be real for until probably we're 70 at yeah. least. And to be honest, I'm not convinced retirement will actually exist the way it does now. I think it's all going to evolve to something far more fluid, right? And, and you know, you'll go from one hour, to one day a week working to five days down to no oh, days uh, to. Peter, I heard a great term uh, since I moved out here. It's called a victory lap, a victory lap retirement. Have you heard this? No. So actually there's two terms, glide path and victory lap. Your glide path is like I'm five years out. I'm just going to cruise on down. So yep. rather than retire at 65, I might retire at 70 because those last five years I'm just going to cruise. Yes. And then at 70, I'm going to have one year of a victory lap, just cruising at work, saying goodbye to everyone, um, you know, taking all my long service, taking all my annual leave, doing yeah. do, doing my holidays on the company dime, and, and then go out, <laughs> go out on my victory lap, then go into retirement. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. I like it. And the thing is, all of it's 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 just not the the date. You know, the oh, at that. I mean, it used to literally be a date. Like it would yeah. be, you know, the twenty third of August in nineteen eighty four. Like it, yeah. it literally was a date. It's yeah. just not going to be that anymore. And so, and how bizarre that we spend so much time focusing on that stage of life without focusing on what's going on now and what happens in between now and then. It's truly bizarre. And you've only got to have somebody in your extended network pass away young and suddenly that seems somewhat idiotic, to be honest. It seems (laughs) irresponsible not to at least provide some insights into, into, you know, the now and the period up to retirement because who knows what's going to happen. Yeah, you know, um, living is important. Totally, um, for sure. Um, it's and it's it's an interesting. All of this is 
it's so innate and, and we all sort of nod a lot. We're like, of course. I think the challenge then for advisors is, you know, we're we're talking about a utopia here in terms of a service <laughs> and it's going from where they are now to to that utopia. And one of the things they're going to have to handle is the other tech that they're using and it might be mandated by a dealer group or, you know, all that sort of thing. How do you guys, how have you approached integration with tools? Yeah. Yeah, so we got a couple um, that are alive and, and most used within Australia, obviously being Salesforce and XPlan. Yep. Um, if you're going to start anywhere as a fintech, they're probably the right places to start. <laughs> yep. um, and, and, you know, we're, we're actively working with a, a couple investment platforms that we'll have done uh, relatively yep. soon. And, and probably the, the, the way that I sort of talk through integrations, the way that we think through integrations is what role do we want them to play within the Lumion? advice experience and yes. all this wonderful stuff that we've spoken about, we sort of sit back and go, right, if this is the ideal end-to-end Lumen experience, if I was a user using every module in order as designed, where do I need the most help? Well, yep. I need to plug into a CRM because, yep. you know, I'm not going to live in Lumen every minute of every day. I'm, you know, I've still got, you know, um, service delivery I've got to do. I've still got yep. follow-up call. To, I've got to do. So my CRM tells me that. Yep. Um, so that's cool. Um, I've still got to produce advice, hence X plan, right? Yep. <laughs> um, and, you know, it, it, whilst we talk about this beautiful utopia of what my life needs to look like, I still need the gas in the tank to drive the car to the, towards that. <laughs> yes. And that's my investments. <laughs> yeah. That's my investments, right? So, okay, let's, let's get some investment platforms, some of the most common ones within Australia and get them feeding in so that we can get live updates so that, I can have the picture of my life. I can have a sort of almost live um, fact find experience uh, with with um, you know, data aggregation through. Oh, we've got Yodely as well. Yep. Um, so data aggregation through Yodely. I can sort of get my net worth um, you know, ongoing through my investment platforms being updated all the time. Yep. Um, and I can see everything as close as close as possible in, in real time. So that's how we're sort of thinking through the integration piece and yep. how I'd urge advisors listening to this to think through their integration piece. Like really sit back and go, my end-to-end experience, what tech do I need to play what role and do they talk and do they, do they speak? Integrations are important, no doubt, um, but that won't be the differentiator between your experience um, working. No, it won't. And I, and I completely agree. And I think I see a lot of people talking, oh, we want the, the all-in-one or we, you know, we want it to all integrate with everything. It doesn't need to. They certainly need to run well in parallel. So that sure. you certainly can't have one sort of mess up what's going on in the other because of, yeah. but that's bad process design generally. It's less about the tech. Sure. It's more about the process, I find. Sure. Um, and I I think we underrate the human API, you know, the use of, of a team member being the interface. Sometimes that's actually a great thing because that's the – some, you know, systems can't – use apply EQ and sometimes that's what's going to be required in between the two things. You know, sometimes it's, yeah. oh, that's got triggered. Do we need to, you know, flag that in the other system or not? Like it it requires that sort of logic or and it's more than logic, it's the EQ. So I'm with you. I think integration is important just from a, a user experience if there's double handling. You know, it's that yeah. sort of client data, you know, entering things twice sort of stuff for sure. But I do think we overcook it sometimes what we're looking for. I agree with you, Peter. I, you know, it, it, here's me proving I was a fanboy, right? I'd said this to you when, when we booked the podcast. I remember hearing you speak at the Less Talk More, Act, More Action yes. conference down in Ooh. St Kilda. It would have been four or five years ago, renovation yes. before automation. Yep. You spoke about microprocessors and, you know, the questions you must ask when you get down to microprocessors. Can tech do it? Can I do it? Can someone do it that's cheaper than me? Yep. I, I, I still think those questions exist. Yes. Right. And Absolutely. the answer isn't always tech. No. No. And in fact, you could expend a whole lot of energy to make it be done by tech and it end up being a crappy experience. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I, I remember having this conversation at work maybe a few years ago. Um, I, I'm, I'm okay with spreadsheets, right? Right. I'm, but I'm not great at them. Right. And uh, I remember the, the analyst I was working with at the time in the project watched me. We're on a Zoom screen share, um, watched me go through a spreadsheet and sort some data. And he was like, mate, you could have cut out about 15 steps. And I was like, yeah, but I got there in five minutes. And I'm happy with five minutes. That's fine. Yep. <laughs> I'm cool with that. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm not, yep. I'm not, I'm not that busy where 
you know, right. four, four minutes 30 to <laughs> back in my pocket will, will make a huge difference. Yeah, correct. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. And it's working out where it does. And in fact, often um, we're, like you say, we're looking for efficiency in the wrong place. You know, so, I mean, I'm I'm always wary of outsourcing data collection. So, in terms of making a client enter a whole lot of information, I think it can work, but that's got to be an experience too. You know, so it's, oh, but it saves yeah. me time. Yeah, but your poor client has got to enter 400 fields. Like, Really? Is yeah. that a good customer experience? You know, so I think that's the challenge when we focus too much on on efficiency and don't sort of have as our foundation that consumer experience because Well, it goes back to where you see your value lie, right? Yeah. And and where you where you see the most value because okay, uh, to go back on the statement I just said, four and a half minutes is important to me if I could get that back, but I'll tell you where I wouldn't apply it, learning a spreadsheet. No. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. How, how if you were doing that same thing 20 times a day for five days a week, yeah, yeah, yeah for an yeah. exercise. Exactly right. right. Yeah. I just have to get yeah. in, get out of the spreadsheet. But yeah, well, it's not, if it's it a was, uh, yeah. yeah, if it yeah. was, uh, yeah, a, a Slack hack where I'm, I'm in that four hours of the day communicating with our dev team, Absolutely. I'm invested. I'm in. <laughs> Me too. I'm obsessed with Slack <laughs> workflows. We we use Slack workflows all the time in the business because it can make a huge yeah. difference to the team. Um, yeah, I'm with you. It's it's where is the magic, right? Where's Correct. that going to actually make a difference? Where's it going to add the most value to me? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Now, in terms of then your current users, and they've all you know got wrinkly fingers from being immersed in Lumion and really getting excited <laughs> about it, then. You know, is there elements though that you've you guys have been surprised that people haven't gone further and really taken advantage of? Is there sort of any of those hidden gems that are you know even even more value that could be unlocked? Yeah, um, I, I'm going to cite a really good example that I heard as simple as last night, uh, as 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 recent as last night. Sorry, um, I was talking to our innovation hub, who are a, a, a suite of power users, um, and that we go to. To, to, to sort of bounce ideas off, hear what's going on in the industry and and sort of go, here's how we're thinking about things. Yeah. Um, they also give us access to their clients to test things, which is great. Um, yeah. So I'm forever grateful for those guys. Shout out. One of them <laughs> spoke to me yesterday and said, hey, um, I actually think there's value in aligning someone's expenses to their values and here's how I'm doing it. And I was like, we haven't even thought of that. That's amazing. Um, and it's not within our product. I mean, we, we give you the five values, you get that, but like aligning their expenses to that so that they can have a conversation around, um, you know, are you spending in line with your values? Crikey. Uh, mm. like, <laughs> so yeah. I, I share that example because there's tons of features within our product, but to go back to a point you made earlier, a lot of it is how are you thinking about it for the experience right. and proposition you've got, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that, that's one where someone really surprised me. The, the one that I'm, I'm actively working on right now and that I think we can get heaps more value is we've got great metrics and great data in our platform. So, you know, um, you know, your clients top areas of wellbeing they want to work on, you know, their top five values, you know, their wellbeing score, you know, their progress to values, you know, the, progress the strategy you know they're 86 percent on track to heal we've got tons of metrics I, I think we can use that really really well right um and people could use it right now because you can track those things over time to your point it's a graph it goes up or goes down but i yeah. don't think we use it to the power that it could be which is gamifying the experience setting challenges um, thinking about next best actions and everyone will go, oh, is that AI? Maybe, but, but also like whatever humans could, humans could figure that out. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah you know, sure. Their top areas of wellbeing are, are social. So they want to spend more time with their friends and, um, their top value is dedicate more time to those that I love. Like, yeah. I reckon the answer is pretty obvious if you work yeah. with it. <laughs> like, yeah, um, so um, I, I think there's something in there around how we connect all that data together in a way that makes it super obvious for people and yep. gamifies the experience to go, based on everything that's in here, here's where we think you need to be. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and in terms of then, you were sort of talking about what you've been working on. There's probably some things that that are coming up on the development path. Yeah. Maybe some of them, sometimes some of those are, you know, a bit dull but necessary um, and others are, are exciting stuff. I'm keen to hear about those, but I'm also sort of keen to hear about the blue sky, you know, so where are, where's Lumion heading and what might be down the track if you guys can sort of pull it off? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a few that I'm super proud of. So I'll try and go through this really quick. We're, we're about to launch our net worth module, which takes all our fact find information, all our live feeds and puts it together in a, uh, a, a, a way to track net worth over time. Um, nice. Not just across your investment platform, but all your assets. Um, now, yeah, you, you, there might be people in the audience going, hypocrisy. That's about numbers. You're all about values. <laughs> We recognize there's quant data you need and qual data you need. Yeah. Net worth seems to be the, the most needed it's a headline. quant data. Yeah. It's a headline, right? So we've got that. We think that's a ticket to the game stuff. Pretty proud about that. Yeah. Um, we're revamping our best life modeling tool. Super excited about that one. Why am I so excited about it? We've had it live for about a year now. What we've observed is it's pretty simple. It could be simpler. It could be much more engaging. Um, and we, we think we found some cool ways to do that. Um, spoiler alert, we think it's about getting different views for different types of clients. Yeah. Um, so really simple views for simple clients, more advanced views for advanced clients, more sophisticated yeah. views for sophisticated clients yeah. and having you dictate that experience and giving them cool sliders and toggles that, that use all the data in there and, and sort awesome. of play that all back. Super excited about that. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're thinking mobile, um, you know, we're, we're actively working on that. You can't be an advice engagement platform um, where, and, and not engage people in probably the most used device in their life. Yeah. Um, once again, I, you know, I'm no genius. It just makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and look, phone, mo- phone notifications are, I think, an untapped communication technique, agree. particularly for a nudge. If you just want, agree. like, I just need you to do this little thing. Like, it's yeah, perfect. and you know, we think we've got a pretty complete we got a pretty complete data set to do that. You know, yeah. because it's not just money, but we've got your strategies, we've got your values, you've got your areas of well being and your goals, and it's all supported by a process where you've sort of felt included. So you're not just getting nudged by some machine; you're actually getting nudged, being like, oh, "I remember the chat that I had about that." Yeah, um, which alludes me to Blue Sky. Uh, I mean, mm. we've kicked around this, and I feel like every tech provider will be kicking around AI. Um, but, but I'll tell you how we're thinking about it um, because I think that's where Blue Sky is. Yeah. Um, let me tell you the problem I see with it and then how we're thinking through it. So <laughs> the problem I see with AI is financial planning is fundamentally human. Mm. Um, and to get behavior change, you, you need to recognize the human. Um, and one thing that AI will never be able to do is recognize that if you ask a question, uh, someone's actively silent, someone's crying, someone yeah. ha- has pulled a word, someone is leaning forward, the other person's leaning back. It will never get that. So, yeah. you know, we need to recognize that that human experience needs to exist. However, if you can have that human experience and feed that data into, into an engine, that doesn't just recognize what you fed in about that client, but how you've helped all your clients. Yep. And finds trends, patterns around that. Yeah. Fine. Maybe even compares that around people's well being and values that are within a broader data set. Yep. And and helps you with a people like you type experience. Yeah. I think there's something in there for that mm. because of connecting the human to the data set, to the nudge. Yes. Now, the reality is Apple could do this tomorrow, right? But yeah. where I think the key difference is Apple hasn't had a values conversation with you. They've no. just stalked all your data. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> right? absolutely. And I think, I think the delivery of those two nudges are completely different if you've had a human experience before you get it. Definitely, without a doubt. And I think um, – you know, the power or the good power of AI will be the quality of the information it's looking at. And Absolutely. The, and that's where if it's within an environment that's got, like you say, the values and all those sort of things from the client base that say that advisor is looking at or whatever it might be, then the quality of the data is is better than just the great unwashed. <laughs> and then you get all yeah, well, of the feedback and absolutely. insight from all of that, right? It can be it. It's because I think AI we see as this faceless big being. It can be as big or as small as we like. We we define that 
you know, of, of what it's looking at and what it absorbs information from. So I exactly. agree that's where the power will sit is how that, we define that's where the power what it's will looking be. at. I think, you know, the, the other data set that's often not spoken about that, that I think is just as important as the end client data set is, is you as the, as the advisor. So yeah. take the same data set. If we were to nudge, it needs to feel like something that Peter D would do with their clients. Right. Not what Lumiant would do with that client. Exactly. Be- because you actually do things a little bit different to Mark Ackroyd and, and, you know, that, that other advisor down the road. And, and absolutely. That's why we think your data set matters to do that as well. Because if it was just how Lumiant would do it, I think people would sort of sniff through that pretty quick. Well, and it, and it would become, it would become too average. Um, in that it would have yeah, too yeah. many too many people's views, which just means you get the generic. <laughs> you totally. know what you and and it'll be it'll be really exciting for an advisor who really sort of does narrow down who they're serving because, you know, let's imagine it's I don't know there might be an advisor that starts a business that looks after people who want to run marathons globally, like it's this thing sure. that they want to do. Yeah. Then the data, like there'll be real themes in that the way they spend, the way they save, what they spend it on, their health, their, like there'll, there'll start to be some real themes. And so that's when AI can get really clever is there will be some some things it can represent or, or feed, like you say, nudge or feedback because yeah. the people you're talking to also have some some consistencies and sort of a, like a theme to their community. Um, that gets exciting, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that really yeah, we're, we're we're super excited by that future, and and you know we're we're humble uh, humble enough to know that with with that sort of power comes responsibility, and we we can't lose sight of the human at the end of it, whether that be the client or the advisor, and and that's certainly what we're pouring effort into right now. How do we help our humans deliver great human centric experiences? Absolutely, and look, I think the other thing that's interesting is something we don't do currently is well, advisors or sorry, advice practices or even financial sure. services generally don't don't normally have a community that talks amongst itself, right? So much like Ensemble is, Ensemble is this community. <laughs> and, and it's not that we all talk to M all the time, although we all love talking to M, shout out to M um, in Ensemble. I love but, getting M Sunday emails. Right, right. So <laughs> so we all love that. But actually it's the, it's the conversations amongst the community um, that feeds it. And what some listeners might not know is there's an AI that's sort of looking for themes there. What are the questions that advisors are asking all the time? What are the things that are frustrating them? What Now, if we can try and build that for a community of clients, then you can solve the problems they don't even realize they have because it'll be what they're talking about and what they, they're all, yeah, that frustrates me too. And, you know, whatever that might be, we can start to just, you know, really, um, they'll, they'll think that we live in their pocket. They'll be like, oh my goodness, I didn't even know I realized that, but what a relief that you're providing that service now. You know, so I think there's some genius there for AI in that sense as well, is really yeah. listening, you know, listening to what the consumer is experiencing um, so that we can, you know, do better and, and provide some more sort of unusual perhaps but innovative solutions. Super exciting. Is there anything we've missed? Um, probably. Probably. <laughs> or, always. Um <laughs> Uh, look, you know, um, if we, we keep talking about our Lumiant roadmap, something we're really excited to bring to Australia that you might have seen in the news uh, recently, we, we acquired a company here in America called um, uh, Genevity, who, whose right. flagship product, Halo, uh, which yes. stands for Health and Longevity Optimizer, is something we're super excited to bring. Um, you know, in the US, the, I don't know if you know this, but the leading cause of bankruptcy post-retirement is healthcare because- yeah. Shock! Um, yeah. The healthcare system isn't as good as we've got back <laughs> no. home. But um, what what the what the um, what this tool does, and why we're so excited about it, is it, it reads uh, hereditary, social, and lifestyle factors, helps give you a, a, a more accurate sense of longevity, uh, the years that you'll have active in retirement, the years that you'll need to be in extended care, the cost of said years, and allows you to toggle on or off lifestyle choices that you can make now that might impact or extend those. Yep. Now. As I explain that, you'll probably realize why we're so excited about it because if you can connect financial data and financial information um, and trade-offs around that to health and lifestyle trade-offs all aligned to your values, we think that's a pretty holistic picture and we yeah. think your clients can become truly healthy, wealthy and wise. So, yeah, I'd probably I'd probably kick myself if we didn't speak about that. But it's, you know, it's something that we've got here in the US that we're, we're actively looking to bring, bring over in Oz, so uh, a little bit of a, a sweetener for the audience to, to keep an eye out. 
Absolutely. And that's exciting from a sense that like longevity is a risk we all talk about, but it's something that's not easy to make tangible for an individual. You know, it just feels like once again, it's the average. Oh, it'll be about this. Like, really? Yeah, um, so well, to factor that in, um, to make it more personal to that, to that indivi- individual, what a difference that can make. No, no life is average. It's, it's, it's as simple no. as that. It's simply not. In fact, yeah. you're right. None of them are. Half of them are, you know, above that and half of them are below. So, yeah. you know, an well, average in itself it's, is, you know, is again, ludicrous. I, I'm, no, I'm no rocket scientist, but I think that's how averages work. Exactly, <laughs> right? It's crazy. Yeah. Well, all right, Advice Explorers, if you'd like to find out more about Lumion, then the website link is in the episode show notes along with Mark's LinkedIn details. So I'm sure he will then point you toward the right people um, to engage with and get a demo. Thank you so much for joining me on the show here today. I've loved this conversation and I'm actually quietly excited to see how Lumion and where it goes to help us engage even deeper with our clients. Uh, Peter, you know, thank you so much for having me. This has been a, an absolute wild ride. I, I could chat about this with you for hours and uh, I look forward to chatting with you about this for hours as uh, as our relationship progresses. And, Next time. Uh, all, all the best to everyone out there. So, so thank you so much for having me. Ooh, well, thank you for sticking with, with us there, folks. I know that was a longer episode than normal, but, you know, what a fascinating um, individual and also, you know, concepts, I think, that we can all start to really open our minds about the way we engage uh, with our clients and, and the experience that we build for them. Um, I'd love to know if you're a user of Lumiant, if you've embedded that in your practice. So please head over to the Ensemble community platform and and share your insights. You know, what worked, what haven't, what hasn't worked, any of those elements, you know, please share them. And if there's some magical, wonderful thing that that surprised you or that that surprised a client, you know, um, got a great reaction out of them, then we all would love to hear for any of the tech we talk about. You know, all of those stories are fantastic to give us context about whether it might apply to us. Now, as for my thoughts, I think, you know, and we mentioned during the conversation this, oh, that's wonderful. You know, there's this, this advice experience utopia. Um, and while that can be exciting, I think it can also be really overwhelming, right? And we can just go, oh, for goodness sake, you know, you know I've got my five step, step advice process. How the hell am I going to go from that to this, this utopia? And, you know, I'm right there with you. Um, We're literally going through that in our business and trying to work out how we constantly deliver that next level of experience. And I guess if you've just not really gone down this path before, but you're keen to start, then one of the things I just get you to do is get you and your team together or some some colleagues. You could even just, you know, head over to to somebody's meeting room, give it a few hours and, and what I'd love you to do is brainstorm all the things you love about the what the the experience you provide your clients currently. What do you love? What do you think just is awesome? What do they think is awesome? You know, brainstorm all of that. That's going to be on one side of the whiteboard. And then on the other side, what do you hate? Like, oh God, that's awful. And you know, what do you think the clients hate or are indifferent to even? Whatever, we'll do it if you tell us to. So brainstorm all of that to start to get a sense of what things you could start to work on so that you're moving some of the things that you hate or that that are in, they're indifferent to or the clients hate into the love category? What are some things that you think you could start to investigate, research and change in the experience to start to elevate more of, more of them into the wonderful sort of level? Um, and sometimes that will be engaging with a tool like Lumiet. It's the thing that will sort of kick you, start you into that thinking. Sometimes you'll do some smaller things um, before that, before implementing a tech tool. You might um, come up with an individual um you know, maybe it's a type of meeting you have that's drawing them out on their goals or like you could just start adding in some things, um, you know, and and debating it with your peers, with other advisors. Hey, I was just thinking of doing this. Has anybody tried that? That's the power of Ensemble is really getting together to help help us sort of cut through the um, – pain and suffering and mistakes we all make when we're trying these new things. You know, I'm a big fan of don't make the same mistakes as me, make new mistakes. So if we all share, uh, then we can get further ahead. So I just encourage, really brainstorm it and don't, don't worry initially about what the rules are and all the things we're required to do. That's a given, you know, we're going to get that right. But 
just look at it as an experience. Look at it like you would a dining experience or going to a wonderful theme park experience or any of those things. If you were going to assess what was awesome and what sort of sucked about it, do the same to the experience your your clients go through with advice. And and where you can, try and turn off our cheerleader bit, you know, where we're like, no, this is great. You know, this experience is really good. It might be compared to the peers. You could have a wonderful experience compared to every other advisor in Australia. But when you compared it to the best, um, I don't know, you know, spa in Bali, or when you compare it to first class flying, or when you compare it to all these other experiences in life we have, how does it resonate then? You know, how does it measure up then? And invariably, we're going to go, oh, well, no, it's not as exciting as that, or it doesn't have that same impact, or they don't get that same joy or inspiration, or, you know, let's start measuring ourselves against different types of experiences and see where we can get creative and and really start to, you know, push the envelope of the way we can engage with the public. I think, you know, if we can do that uh, and if we can start to think about, yes, we need to be efficient. Yes, we need to value our time and our clients, but how can we just bring in that magic, right? How can we make it a magical experience? I think, you know, that is a future evolution of financial advice I'm really up for um, and I'm hoping you are too. Now, we've come up to our curiosity corner section here, folks, um, and, you know, to help us build that that curiosity habit and become closer to being bionic advisors, then the app that I'd love you to take a look at this week is called AI Playground. Now, the link is somewhat strange, so I'm just going to include it in the episode show notes. Um, it's a little hard to spell out, but basically, this is a tool that's trying to give you a sense of the different AI tools out there for things like content creation. So, it's a very specific application of AI. But basically, the tool takes your input or request. So when you go into an AI, you you enter a prompt or a question or a request, right? So then it um, takes that input um, and it, you know, specifically designed for an LLM, and we'll cover what an LLM is in a minute, and it provides you with the different responses from a variety of AI tools, Right. So now what's an LLM? An LLM is a large language model. And this is a type of artificial intelligence algorithm that actually uses this sort of deep learning technique and really massive large data sets to understand and then summarize, generate and even predict new content. So it's sort of what's going on behind chat GPT and things like it. Right. Um, That's what an LLM is. And you might have heard the term generative AI. This is closely connected with LLMs, um, but they're actually, in fact, a type of generative AI, right? That's So it's like the higher category generative, generative, hard to say, AI. And then LLMs are under that category because LLMs are specifically architected, architected, is that a word? Designed to help generate text-based content as opposed to other generative AI that might be, you know, images and stuff like that. So what this tool is doing is it's comparing those AI language models. And there's so many out there of these LLMs, you know, it can be um, ChatGPT, GPT-4, Alpaca, all sorts of models. Um, And the AI playground lets you write a single prompt and then compare the responses from a selection of models that you might enter Um, and just work out what works best for you, right? It's just, it's a bit of a matchmaking exercise, right? And you get a sense of what you think will work best for your application of it. Like I said, this is, you know, this is really only for the super keen or curious. um, But if you are just sort of really trying to play and get a sense of AI, this will be a way for you to get sort of amplify that testing, right, to really get a sense of it um, and give you that sort of side by side comparison of the different models and the responses that they come up with. So, you know, feel free, have a play and see what happens. Well, it's a long one. Thank you for sticking with us, folks. Um, Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll get your advice tech fix automatically sent to you each Friday. And you know what? 
if you need some inspiration in the team, you're looking to revamp um, your user experience, you revamp your, the tech that supports it, maybe the processes, what projects should you have on, um, then, you know, I'd love to run an in-person facilitation for your team uh, to get that humming. Uh, it's a lot of fun and it can go all sorts of places really designed for you and your team. So if that's of interest, please reach out to me on LinkedIn forward slash Peter MD. That's P-E-I-T-A-M-D. Otherwise, I'll look forward to turning up in your earbuds next week. And remember, Advice Explorers, stay curious.